Welcome everyone to the third session of the online series Max Weber as a political theorist, domination, democracy, and revolution in the late writings. This is a series organized by the Weber Scholars Network. And this afternoon we have Stephen Turner and Carmen Chas discussing the topic democracy and the rule of law. I will uh, chair the session and the first thing I'm going to do is to introduce the presenters, beginning with uh, Stephen Turner, who is a distinguished university professor at the University of South Florida. Stephen has authored hundreds of articles and 14 books, uh, of which I would like to mention three, which are particularly relevant for the topics we are going to talk about this afternoon. Uh, the oldest one is uh, Max Weber and the Dispute over Reason and Value, co-authored with Redis Factor, 1984. The second book I want to mention is Max Weber, The Lawyer as a Social Thinker, uh, which was also co-authored with, uh, with Stephen, also co-authored with Red Redis Factor. And finally, a third book co-authored with George Masur, whose title is making democratic theory democratic, democracy, law, and administration after Weber and Kelsen, which was published last year. Um, Stephen is going to present for uh, about 30, 40 minutes, and then Carmen has 15 minutes for her comments, and then we will begin what uh, I hope will be a lively debate. Without further ado, Stephen, the floor is yours. Um, okay, so the title is uh, Weber Kelsen and the Rule of Law, Liberal Ideology Critique. And uh, um, what I'm trying to, to do here is to try to figure out what, um, what they're trying to say about the rule of law. Uh, even though neither one of them spends much time actually on the concept of the rule of law. And there's a reason for that. So part of uh, what the, the paper is about is why they don't say that explicitly, but they do say it implicitly. So the background is, uh, this is a concept with uh, a very <laughs> peculiar history uh, because it, it actually arises from the interaction or the, the uh, observance of English law by uh, Germans. And uh, the, um, the key thinker here is Rudolf Gneist, who uh, um, has an excellent book on the English parliament that uh, goes through the whole thing. And he, he's sort of the progenitor of the idea that this is a model to be uh, copied in uh, uh, Germany, and then the question becomes, um, uh, when it gets translated back into English, is it, are they talking about something else, and are uh, these book concepts have sort of different uh, ideological valences? Um, and they certainly have different, they acquire different ideological valences. Um, but uh, the, there are some standard definitions in this case. So the rule of law is, um, uh, in this case, um, the emphasis was on the idea that everyone is subject to law and should therefore obey it, but in governments in particular are supposed to obey the law and to govern under or in accordance with law. And this is where things get tricky. Once, once you say that, uh, it's a very straightforward uh, definition. Um, then the question is, how do you make it happen? And the answers become very complicated. So what is, it, what is required in practice for uh, the rule of law to actually work? Uh, do you need a constitution? Um, and this is a pretty interesting problem right in the present, because in uh, Israel, where there is no constitution, because you couldn't get uh, Orthodox Jews to agree on anything, uh, so you couldn't have a, you could, they never established a written constitution. So now they're talking about it, and there's a big controversy about that. But 
the problem there is then you've got courts that uh, enforce the rule of law, but you don't have any control over uh, the courts. So um, one solution to the problem of protecting the rule of law is, well, you have judges who are independent and have the power to uh, impose sanctions or more usually allow other people to impose sanctions in accordance with the law. But also uh, uh, one view, and it was probably Kelsen's view, is that you need a democratic populace that actually supports the rule of law and uh, uh, votes for it and so forth. So you can add on all of these things and um, uh, worry about whether they're essential to uh, the rule of law. And so there's a long history of talking about the rule of law, which sneaks these uh, additional things into the definition. And one of the ones that I'm going to worry about a little bit here is the idea of the sense of law. Uh, is there some thing that hangs around the law, a kind of penumbra of the law that uh, is essential to the concept of the rule of law. And there's some, there's various uh, versions of this. Um, okay. So both, both concepts imply some kind of, uh, sense, an intuitive normative content that are built beyond the statutes that make up the written law. Something that tells us what the law is in accord with or what law is in accord with the rule of law. And this is the mystery element, the sense of law. And there are book titles with uh, 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 exactly that uh, title. Um, and this, this actually becomes a pretty important problem for um, German law in connection with the question of was, was Nazi law real law? And one of the things that's uh, uh, always held against Kelsen is that he said, no, uh, it's law uh, that any um, and he had his own account of what makes law law that uh, disallowed the kind of uh, critique of uh, a legal system as not really being law. And the critiques, the reason for this is the critiques generally fall into the category of uh, natural law. So the idea is that there's God's law or there's a law given by nature. And if a, a legal system is not in accordance with that, it's not really a legal system. Um, but uh, both the concepts, uh, rule of law and Rechstadt, can be construed as constraints on the state. And they're both uh, afflicted with the paradox that the only way in which the law can regulate the state is through the state itself. Um, so the question of who does the regulating, the state or the law, can only end in either a circular argument or a regress to something. So something is on the top. The regress would take you either to the state, which gets you into notions like sovereignty, or it's circular. Um, and or, or you can get, in Kelsen's case, goes back to the notion of a fundamental law that's prior to uh, the state itself, that and that the state is uh, identical to what's given in the law, that there's no, and that works it the other way around, that there's no, uh, anything the state does that's outside of the law isn't really uh, um, either legal or uh, the state. Okay, so the prehistory of this is all connected up with the idea of sovereignty. So uh, does the king uh, make the law or is the king made by virtue of the law? Um, and the same thing goes with uh, uh, law being made law. Is it law by virtue of enactment by the sovereign or is... Uh, the sovereign, the sovereign by virtue of the laws that were already enacted that made made them the sovereign. Um, okay, so what the, both of them share 
is uh, an agreement that the starting point for a discussion of the rule of law is epistemic, a discussion of what the law is as a knowable object. And this should be familiar territory because this is uh, uh, the neo-Kantian way of thinking about uh, all kinds of topics. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, but it's not uh, um, much of a part of the extensive literature on the rule of law, which mostly focuses on the question of uh, what are the features of the legal system that make it count as uh, um, an example of the rule of law. Okay, so neither of them particularly liked these terms, and you can see why. They saw them as uh, ideological and uh, problematic, so they wanted the terminology that wasn't ideological and wasn't mystical, and uh, also got rid of the mystical notion of sovereignty. So it had to be either defined away or demystified. So with uh, Weber, we get the monopoly of legitimate violence within a territory. And for Kelsen, this identity theory that there's nothing to uh, the state other than the law. There's no sort of extra thing there called sovereignty that makes the state the state. Um, so why don't they discuss the rule of law? Well, they do, but they do it under a different label. And of course, this is you know, standard uh, Weberian strategy for dealing with uh, ideologically loaded uh, ideas. And he's very real. He, he doesn't want to even talk about, uh, he doesn't like the phrase, uh, the term customary law, because Sitton has a normative significance. So he says, doesn't like the concept. Um, Kelson wasn't, didn't have a problem with it because uh, it was a classificatory concept for him. Um, but so instead he talks about it as rational legal authority and it's an ideal type. So this has uh, the main features of the Reichstadt, but it, it removes the valuative uh, overtones. And um, calculability, uh, which is predictability and standard lists of characteristics of the rule of law. And if you go online to see uh, ratings of the rule of law, to see whether different countries uh, follow are, are governed by the rule of law. This is one of the top things on the list. But those lists are exactly what they wanted to get away with because they all depend on ideas like judicial independence that um, aren't strictly speaking uh, about the rule of law. They're mechanisms to protect the rule of law, which may or may not be uh, necessary and may or not even be true. So Kelsen thought that the the idea of judicial independence was just a kind of romantic holdover from um, the English uh, um, Revolution, uh, where the judges resisted the crown. Um, but his point was, well, they were appointed by the crown in the first place, so uh, they weren't really independent. They were only uh, uh, slightly independent, and that in the end, judges are part of the uh, uh, political order. Um, okay, so Weber does it in a somewhat different way. He, he he looks at this problem of the separation of office and person as one of the distinguishing features of Western uh, political and legal orders. And uh, so this is pretty crucial. The, 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 the standard way of talking about the rule of law is the rule of law versus the rule of men. And this is the distinction in the form of the problem of uh, the history of law and administration. Um, okay. Um, so Kelson's line, are you following me along, along with this? I'm sorry, I'm not telling you to switch slides. Um, I think I'm, I'm okay, don't worry. Okay. Uh, so Kelson says, 
uh, law can only be, be defined by law. There's a lot more to this. Uh, um, Kelson's distinctive uh, ideas about this. Uh, one uh, uh, idea, one key thing is he doesn't think that judges apply the law or that they follow the law, um, but they're authorized to make law. So every time a, a judge delivers a judgment, he's making law. And uh, the same thing goes for the executive. When the executive makes uh, an order, they're making law, but they're doing it because they're authorized to make certain kinds of law. And if they deviate from those boundaries, then that's what's uh, a violation of the rule of law. But uh, authorization is the, the uh, uh, concept um, that um, he operates with. So the law is a hierarchy of authorizations. That's great, except um, it, it creates this problem, which is, okay, where does the original authorization come from? Uh, who's authorized to make law? And the answer, the, the sovereignty answer that gets into so much trouble is um, uh, that it's the king and uh, or the sovereign, whoever that turns out to be. And that that's, becomes a kind of uh, definitional solution where in modern states, the question is, okay, where does sovereignty actually reside? But since uh, Kelson wants to stick to the idea that law can only be defined by law, not by a person, uh, it has to be another law. And the idea was that, uh, and he varied this uh, histor in his own thinking uh, throughout his life. But basically, it, he saw it as a logical precondition for law itself. Uh, it has to be there. Uh, it's normative and it's uh, uh, purely legal. It's the norm that says authorizes the making of law in the first place. Um, so if there, there's going to be law, there has to be a law authorizing um, uh, law. But it's this is uh, not a um, uh, an actual uh, law, although constitutions can serve as uh, um, um, sort of simulacrums of that and function like that as the highest of uh, laws. But um, even uh, in uh, other contexts, um, there has to be something that makes uh, um, law giving legal. Okay. So, so this is a kind of a messy problem. What is the rule of law? Uh, here, here are the different approaches. The analytic approach that the uh, standard and um, Anglo-American uh, um, legal philosophy is um, like the rest of analytic philosophy. You consult your intuitions and you agree on a definition. And um, if you uh, get agreement, everybody's happy. Of course, nobody's ever happy with this, but you you can write a lot of articles trying to uh, uh, appeal to people's intuitions and come up with a definition. Uh, for Faber and Kelson, these were ideologically in encrusted historical half-truths uh, that were only partially emancipated from their origins in natural law thinking. And that's always the um, um, the other in this in their conception of these things, as well as the uh, uh, Oberkite stat, uh, the, the rule of man over man and the rule of judges, basically. Um, so for them, these these origins have uh, misleading historical affective associations. We sort of have a love of uh, judicial independence, even though it's kind of a fiction. Um, so having intuitions about ideologically encrusted historical half-truths doesn't uh, cut it with them. Um, or having intuitions about their essences 
um, was also uh, not of uh, interest. Their problem was different to strip the notions of their ideological uh, content. Um, okay. So the differences between them. Um, Kelsen writes three giant texts on that are slightly different, but it also respond to different things and advance the argument in somewhat different ways. One is uh, published posthumously. There's disputes about whether he really meant these things because it wasn't published while he was alive, blah, blah, blah. But in any case, there is a kind of, uh, of uh, evolution in his thinking, which um, purifies everything. The push is always to uh, eliminate the problematic ideological, valuative, and uh, um, problematic philosophical elements that were not necessary for understanding the concept of law itself. Uh, Weber um, uh, used treated validity as um, ideological or value of concept. Um, and Kelsen's uh, um, line was, any discussion of the law presupposes a real concept of the law, meaning valid law. And so is his... Um, the difference, it, now Kelsen actually writes a long book on sociological jurisprudence. Um, his original critique of Weber was that uh, a, a very neo-Kantian kind of critique, which was that you couldn't have a sociology of the law that didn't presuppose a concept of the law and not just a sociological concept, but a real concept of the law. Uh, that sociology... Uh, presupposes normative uh, uh, concepts of the law, or a, a, any a normative concept of the law. Um, so Weber uh, made the distinction um, between the history of law, which is a naturalistic discipline, and um, its object is the facticity of the legal norm and not its ideal meaning. Um, so so um, uh, what Kelson's concerned with is the ideal meaning. Um, and um, uh, Weber thinks of this as a dogmatic science, a normative science, which establishes what is valid according, according to the rules of juristic thought which is partly bound by logically compelling arguments and partly by conventionally given schemata. Okay, so that's uh, um, his his uh, uh, dismissal of um, a traditional jurisprudence, but it's also a, uh, a characterization that actually fits relatively well with Kelsen's own uh, conception. Um, okay, so the issue then becomes different points of view. Um, there's this juridical point of view, which is also Kelson's, that aims at the correct meaning of propositions, the content of which constitutes an order supposedly determinative for a defined group of persons. And it treats those as facts. Um, so the and this is an important um, move. Uh, the jurist uh, takes for granted the empirical validity of legal propositions and examines each of them and tries to determine its logically correct meaning in such a way that all of them can be combined with a system which is logically coherent, that is, free from internal contradictions. Uh, this is the legal order in the juridical sense of the word. This is pretty much uh, Kelson's uh, view as well. That, um, and there's a reason that they make this move um, having to do with um, uh, neo-Kantianism, which um, we, we can end up discussing. But 
the problem with neo-Kantianism, which uh, is his background both to Weber, but he uh, effectively abandons it, and Kelsen, who also uh, effectively abandons it. But so they're both part of uh, really a generation that's moving away from um, a neo-Kantianism. And one reason they're moving away from it is the pre the history of uh, uh, neo-Kantianism in legal theory itself. So the basic neo-Kantian idea from Cohen is that you've got some coherent uh, um, science and, and you can treat that as a fact, a fact and der, der Wissenschaft. And then you can ask the philosophical question, what's the presupposition of this thing being a fact and our, our epistemic uh, grasp of this thing as a fact? And that was supposed to get uh, agreement on what those presuppositions were. Um, the problem was uh, two problems. One, underdetermination. Different philosophers found different presuppositions. So they weren't really ne logically necessary presuppositions because if they're alternatives, ne neither one is logically necessary. But the other problem was circularity. So if you define the law in a certain way, you're going to get one set of presuppositions or one range of possible presuppositions. But if you define it in another way, you get another range of presuppositions. So a factum der Wissenschaft is not as autonomous. It has to itself be uh, um, defined. So what they they uh, what what Kelsen does is say says. Uh, I'm going to break up that circle and define the law as the actual positive law, the facts that the judge that, that the, we were talking about in the earlier slide, uh, the facts of the law that the judge uh, deals with. Um, they, they treat the legal system as a fact. Um, so Be Weber... Um, uh, so Kelsen says, yeah, we're not looking at da data of consciousness and not to the me intended meaning of legal norms, but uh, um, to uh, um, the, the meaning of positive laws. So you got a law book and you're looking at the meaning of the law book, not, not the meaning of what's in anybody's head. And Weber, at the, in the uh, introduction to the economy and society, also talks about understanding legal systems as a coherent intellectual object like mathematics. And that is the way uh, um, uh, Roman law was, uh, in fact, taught. Uh, and uh, in contrast to Anglo-American law, which is more a law of precedent, um, Continental law is a, a co designed to be and uh, based on Roman law is a logically coherent um, system. Okay. Um, but there's then becomes a problem of, about meaning. Um, there's the, the actual existing meaning in a given concrete case uh, and the theoretically conceived pure type of subjective meaning attributed to the actor that uh, in a given type of action. Um, and neither one of those is the objectively correct meaning or the one which is true in some metaphysical sense. And this is what makes something an empirical science like sociology and history as opposed to a metaphysical uh, uh, science. Okay, so this sounds a bit like uh, uh, Popper's third world, that there's some uh, pure, uh, um, objectively correct meaning out there, but uh, what determines people's behavior is actually uh, what people think, meaning what is in their head. The, the, uh, um, and we can... Um, construct ideal types of those things as well. So we can think of the, the uh, uh, 
judicial sense of 18th century English judges and construct an ideal type of that, uh, which is different than the abstract ideal type of uh, the objectively correct, true, metaphysically valid sense of law. Um, so that's the distinction between a historical use of an ideal type and uh, this metaphysical use. And it's interesting that um, the, a person that you wouldn't have ever expected think would think like this is uh, Rudolf Carnap. And uh, Carnap um, actually uh, um, was engaged with a kind of uh, cultural theorist who uh, uh, thought that, uh, yeah, that, that there were objective cultural facts out there uh, in addition to the things that logical positivists usually worry about, like sense data. So um, that that's an idea that has its own history and uh, uh, plausibility. Um, okay, so f from Weber wanted to say back to Kelsen is that, well, we don't really need actual validity to talk about uh, law and sociology. We don't worry about the logically correct objective meaning of these things. So that third world out there of, of the objective reality of the law uh, doesn't matter for sociology. Uh, what we're concerned about is the ideas of men about the meaning and, and their ideas about the validity of legal propositions, which is what determines their actions. And they're always thinking here of judges. Um, what what determines the judge's action and they think they they have a, an idea of what the meaning of the law is and what the, whether it's valid or a lot uh, or not and it's that's what determines their um uh behavior and that's what makes it a naturalistic topic okay so what is the uh, uh occam's razor that the uh, is being used here. Um, when Weber says we don't need this uh, uh, notion of um, of actual validity, which uh, Kelson thought was presupposed by uh, the concept of the law and therefore the concept of, uh, um, of sociology of the law, uh, Weber wants to say uh, that uh, su subjective ideas of people uh, Duale explaining an actual and actual validity, which is in this world three, doesn't add anything to the explanation. It's just what people believe is valid. And this distinction holds all the way through. Uh, if we talk about the state, uh, it's ideas about the state that explain the patterns of action, not the state as a real thing. And this is a, a major difference from the... Uh, whole German legal tradition, which was obsessed with this question of the reality of the state. Um, okay. And the same thing goes with validity. It's ideas of validity, not real validity, which determine what people actually do in the name of the law. So validity fails this test of explanatory necessity. And that's basic Weberian move, but it's taken for granted. It's just the way he uh, argues. And uh, Weber, uh, Kelsen's response is that, yeah, it's about ideas, but the ideas include <laughs> the notion of validity. You can't really get rid of, of, uh, of validity completely in that way. But uh, Kelsen basically makes the same kinds of uh, uh, moves um, that um, there is a uh, uh, an illusory part of uh, people's understanding of the state. And um, uh, this particularly shows up in the case of modern democracy in terms of the idea of the will of the people. Um, so, uh, and it, bears directly on this notion of representation. So the idea is, does uh, a parliament or the parliament, members of parliament represent? Um, 
And this is a kind of mystical uh, relation that's um, um, uh, he says is, is not a scientific theory, but a political ideology. And the function of the ideology is to conceal the real situation, to maintain the illusion that the legislature is the people, uh, in spite of the fact that in reality, the function of the people is limited to the creation of the um, legislative or uh, organ. So what he has in mind is people vote. Uh, they vote according to law. The whole thing is done in according, according to law. And that's the real situation. Uh, the idea that that means that uh, the, the people that are, were elected are uh, real representatives of the, the people. Um, this is all just the ideology. The, the core reality is just the legal reality of uh, voting and stuff. Um, okay. So, um, but both of them are concerned with this question of uh, purity, and uh, um, they have they think that uh, ac actual law is in practice uh, involves mixed mixed forms. Um, so for Weber, it's uh, rational legal domination; it's legal authority. Uh, and charismatic and traditional domination. And Kelsen has virtually the same list. It's religious or revealed law, customary law, and statutory law. Uh, Weber thinks of these as ideal types that are rarely or never found in reality in their pure forms. And he looks at actual present legal orders as mixtures. And he certainly looked at Anglo-American law as uh, very far away from rational law because it had precedent, it had the juries that were had sort of charismatic powers or were understood charismatically and so on. And um, so it was not uh, his his model of uh, law. And the, the idea of precedent is really uh, um, a feature of customary uh, law rather than uh, a rational legal um, system. So Kelsen does the same thing. He says the modern constitutions are mixtures of customary and statutory law. And he also uses the language of uh, uh, ideal types. Now, this is this should be plausible, but I, you know, I think a, 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 just a good example of this is that uh, um, in recent um, uh, U, uh, US legal um, discussions um they go back to the, the first to the constitutional meaning and that we're what was the meaning of those terms at the time what were the customary meanings of those terms at the time of the enactment of the constitution and then they go back and look at uh past usages and so forth so uh it's as though there's a bed of of customary usage that is uh, precondition for understanding the Constitution as it's actually written, and you can't really uh, uh, eliminate that. The um, um, uh, terms don't explain themselves. They depend on uh, their customary uses. Um, okay. So, uh, we get... <sighs> Um, some mutually dependent ideas that are part of rational legal authority, that legal norms can be established by agreement by, or imposition uh, on different grounds with a claim to obedience on at least part of the members of the organization. And it's usually extended to exclude all persons, uh, blah, blah, blah. So the basic idea is that uh, some people to have a legal system or to have rational legal authority, uh, some people uh, submit themselves uh, or uh, obey those things. And it's and obviously it's the judges uh, and uh, the staff of the 
um, ruler. Um, that's one of one idea. And the other is that uh, every body of law is a consistent system of abstract rules, which have normally been intentionally established. And the administration of law, and this is all Weber, is uh, the application of the rules to particular cases. Um, so we'll get into this uh, idea of isonomy a little bit later, but that's uh, really, uh, really crucial that that the uh, the same kind of case gets the same kind of uh, result and within the limits of uh, um, legal precepts, which are formulated in a generalized way. So you can see that the, the different uh, cases are cases of the same thing. Uh, and then this is this is pretty crucial relation to this uh, earlier problem of sovereignty that the superior is also subject to this impersonal order. Um, so it's not just the officials, but it's the president uh, of the state as well, or the king. Um, okay, so. There's an apparent difference here between Weber and Kelsen. Weber doesn't actually have a notion. It doesn't have a notion of the Grimm norm. He doesn't say exactly that the law is norms produced in accordance with norms. But the third item in the list is something close to it. Officials are oriented in their action to an impersonal order, consistent system of abstract rules. So the impersonal order is what authorizes them to act. And uh, it authorizes them in terms of these abstract rules. So this is uh, um, the system of rules is the legitimating principle and the thing that gives these laws uh, legal meaning. It's the belief in the validity and authority of the impersonal order, not merely a belief in its contents. So it doesn't matter really what the law is. What matters is that uh, the... Um, uh, impersonal order is uh, valid. So is there a real difference here? Um, the There is a, a, an apparent difference because they solve uh, the problem of um, uh, in a slightly different way. Um, so most conceptions of the rule of law involved the notion of an effective impersonal order which in which officials act and generate norms according to norms. That's that's is pretty common. That's pretty basic. Um, and when we think of of uh, failures of the rule of law, for example, in a developing world, it's a matter of ineffectiveness in enforcing the law and especially ineffectiveness in enforcing the laws relating to official conduct. So if you have a corruption, that's a failure of the rule of law because the, the official uh, conduct is not regulated by the rule of law. All this, this fits into the fact value system. These are all factual questions in favor sense or in uh, uh, Kelsen slightly more inclusive sense, which includes these normative facts of positive law. So it's the it's the fact of the law that is uh, uh, at stake here. Um, so this raises the question of, is this enough? So that we started out a long way back there with the notion of explanatory uh, necessity. And is it, can we say, well, this is all there is to the rule of law, or is, or is there something else? And uh, there's a whole um, uh, legal, both German and, and um, uh, Anglo-American legal tradition that, that talks about the sense of law. And Kelsen himself, when he talks about international law, um, recognizes that there's no international policeman to enforce the law. But he thought a good that given the fact that the uh, uh, no nation was about to submit to a policeman, he thought, well, they might submit to uh, courts. And so if you had courts that had a sense of the law and made decisions in terms of the sense of the law, as well as within an international law, 
uh, you might have a means of uh, securing uh, at least some kinds of, uh, of uh, peace. And the idea of a sense of law that goes beyond just the written law is shows up in lots of other uh, uh, places. Uh, the reason it's important is that discretionary power is inevitable in both administrative decisions and judicial decisions. The law is never uh, never provides the answer for everything. There's always something that isn't decided that the official has to uh, uh, decide. Um, so if there's a lot of discretionary power out there, you don't really have the rule of law. You have the rule of men. And um, uh, so it, it seems like kind of a need to have something that goes beyond merely uh, um, the law on the books. Um, then there's another question. Is, is there a, a way of talking about improving law, for example, by limiting can, discussion? Sorry. Yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, do you think uh, you, you can finish within the next five minutes? It's my last slide. Okay. Excuse me. Okay. Yeah. So then the question is, um, is there a way of talking about this stuff, uh, especially about limiting discretion, that is not valuative? And um, both Kelson and Weber had the idea that there's such a thing as technical improvement. And mostly what they mean by that is it's something that limits discretion. But uh, it, it, there are limits to that having to do with, with effectiveness. So for example, transparency is, is a value that might impair uh, effectiveness. So you have to talk about trade-offs at that point rather than, than just new law. So that's the end of my story, actually. Um, hope that uh, um, hasn't killed off everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. Um, I'm sure there will be many to you, but let's first listen to what Carmen has to tell us about the rule of law, Carlson, and uh, maybe Mer Max Weber. Carmen? Yes. yes, thank you. The Well, the, before properly starting, and by way of warning, I will say that my main in into this uh, debate is through my uh, background and research in IR theory and international law. Uh, so more on uh, Kelsen and people related to Kelsen than uh, Weber himself. So uh, that's his, since that is how I'm more familiar with the topic, that's how I read the, tape, the paper and will be engaging with it. And uh, I will uh, mostly focus on what I thought of the paper itself and try to open some points for discussion. And uh, I will start by saying that I really enjoyed reading this paper. The and uh, it's the it was for, uh, for instance uh, this month it was the first paper that I could that I got to read that focused on uh, really heavy legal theory and I really I really enjoyed that. The I quite enjoyed how it focused on how it focused on the intentionally subversive aspect of Weber's and Kelsen's thoughts on this topic, uh, particularly because uh, it isn't an aspect of, for instance, Kelsen that it isn't necessarily touched on that often. I thought that it covered the uh, and analyzed the both of their positions on the rule of law, their critiques of it, similarities and differences in a lot of depth and detail, and it was very interesting and engaging. The and the uh, and the the paper the like you just covered the uh, well examines Kelsen and Max Weber's thoughts on the rule of law and the question of validity on the law and its implications, and it does this very jointly, contrasting them very consistently with uh, the two together and their positions and their significance. And uh, I thought that the way it's structured really helps with the discussion, particularly with starting with the. Uh, more core methodological issues that are common to both theorists, which isn't necessarily that obvious and intuitive immediately. The, and then moving on to questions of the rule of law and how, and then a third section on how, on the nothing more, that how the rule of law fits into their picture. 
and then the conclusion with the significance of all of this, right? Because it is significant. And like I like I just said, uh, I thought that the paper did a great job at establishing Kelsen's and Weber's thought on the validity of the law, the rule of law, and how they're similar and different at different points. And it dawned on me when reading the paper that the the exercise isn't necessarily the most intuitive right off the bat. The and for instance, when when dealing with Kelsen, I've seen a lot of Kelsen comparisons with Schmidt and with Morgenthau and things like that, but not necessarily with Weber. Which is uh, quite a shame after reading, I thought after reading the paper, because the, they have, there is something very valuable to explore there, right? The, and, and this is, and the fact this relevance is, is highlighted very early on, right? With how they both uh, dislike the term rule of law in its Anglo-American, how it's used in Anglo-American Anglo -American academia or in literature, right? The fact that the paper starts by covering the their methodological concerns with the question of what is meant by the rule of law and the validity of the law is something that I really enjoyed, like I said. And it lays a very good foundation for the later discussion. And I thought the paper succeeded in establishing the why both of them are relevant very, very well and why they should be read together. The... And uh, it succeeded in linking them very well and how, despite their different uh, focuses and approaches, they arrive at remarkably similar conclusions, right? Which isn't necessarily that obvious in a, on a surface level reading, but I thought that paper established that very well. And it's a very interesting conclusion to reach. The, the fact that the paper highlights how the rule of law and is often associated to this very Anglo-American take on it, reminded me a lot of, uh, for instance, and this is something that came to my mind because of the what I've been reading lately, how, for instance, when uh, Morgenthau and Gelson landed in the US, they had a lot of trouble when attempting to work within academia or in, within US legal academia, right? Because the point of view that was given to the law was completely different from what they were used to. The, and that is a bit tangential, but it came to my mind very uh, quite early on when reading the paper. The paper's discussion in, uh, for example, in pages 26 and 27 on how what we usually refer to fa as failures of the rule of law are not failures of the rule of law per se, but ineffectiveness in, a, in enforcing the rule of law is a question that I thought was particularly interesting to engage with and raise. And with a lot of, like you just mentioned, a lot of significance in international legal debates, right? With uh, There is no international policeman question. So what are we talking about in relation to international law? Is it law? How do we enforce it, et cetera? And that question has a lot of... Uh, a lot of background and depth in international, in IR theory that I know. I thought the paper showed the significance of this idea very, very well through the uh, example of how one can imagine a highly aggressive and intrusive legal regime that still conforms to the question, to the rule of law and how that is uh, quite problematic in different ways. The I quite enjoyed the seeing Hayek mentioned in the paper, the, though not quite mentioned now. I wasn't really expecting to see Hayek mentioned, but I really enjoyed the fact that he was added to the discussion, though wasn't quite expecting it based on the introduction. The and the I also found the discussion on the impact and the question of the rule of law as iterate as iterated by Weber and Kelsen and its impact on the separation of powers and whether an independent and independent judiciary even exists was very interesting. So, and I apologize if I'm saying I found things very interesting a bit too much, but I did, which is why I'm possibly constantly repeating myself here. And this discussion also reminded me a lot of debates on the political nature of the law, the, which, for example, I know Schwarzenberger engaged very deeply with his sociological approach to the law and how the, the how the law functions in society somewhat forces this to be the case, or that's what he argues. And it reminded me a lot as well on uh, Schuett's recent book on Kelsen as a political realist, which in the sense that it's an interesting exercise to see something beyond legal theory in uh, a person who is often only seen exclusively as a legal theorist, right? And how he has something to say. 
the I thought the paper set the discussion on the significance of all of this very well, and the and as well as the implications, and which you just did very well in the presentation as well. And I'm not sure I have much to add to that in relation, uh, in the sense that how we think about these foundational topics ultimately affects how we process and uh, talk about the law, whether it works, and uh, a, a whole lot of very important debates in relation to problems with democracy and as such. The and uh, I thought that uh, a particularly a part, I will actually quote from the paper and uh, a particular line that I thought uh, captured the significance of Weber and Kelsen very well, and that uh, Weber and Kelsen allow us to cut through the haze to see that the law is a coercive order that the rule of law is consistent with a wide range of values and intrinsically connected to the to few of the political ideas and values with which it is normally associated. I thought that was particularly neat, the, in that the, it's not something, even the, uh, with me when approaching the paper, that they really have something quite subversive and powerful to say, right? A very, uh, uh, quite a cutting critique of the idea of the rule of law as typically conceived in Anglo-American uh, jurisprudence. And then... As to more specific comments on things that I thought about the paper in particular, and uh, with the caveat that I may have read the less updated version, the I wasn't necessarily too certain about whether the paper set out clearly enough how unique Kelsen's and Weber's positions and similarities are in relation to other jurists and theorists of their time. And that is something that I was quite interested in asking about, the, how do they, on how what they have to say contrasts and is maybe similar or different from other people of the time. Uh, partially, particularly because I'm not really sure of that. And I'd be very interesting to, interested in hearing what you have to say about it. The And uh, I also wondered the whether in relation to the paper itself, the, whether it would be worth to establishing even if a minor footnote and I may be completely wrong with this. The, what is meant by the sociological approach to the law a bit more clearly, and that's I know what you mean by it, but I'm not quite sure how uh, known that is. I may be completely wrong in saying this, though. And I also thought that establishing a bit earlier in the introduction why this is significant may make the methodological discussion about the validity of the law, or the purpose of it, I mean, a bit clearer. Since the at least off the top of my head, I can't really remember where, how early that was set out. And I was also uh, perhaps interested in hearing the how the paper fits within the current literature, especially the how on the rule of law, I mean, or and the impact on democracy. And how different it is, how similar it is. The, a part of this is born from the fact that I'm not really sure about how it fits because I'm less familiar with that particular bunch of literature. But it's a very it's a very interesting and important discussion to be had. I thought so. That's why I thought to ask it. The and the. I also, as a final point, and this is more of a, a, a final, more minor question, I was also wondering whether I could ask you about why the Anglo-American perspective of the rule of law and Kelsen's and Weber's are so different, though I think you covered this in the in the beginning of the, I noticed, I noted this down on Word on to ask, but I think you covered this at the beginning of the presentation, so, but I'll wrap it up here since I'm rambling a bit, but uh, just to say that I found the paper very interesting. Enjoy reading it, especially the even if and perhaps especially because a majority of it was a heavy discussion on the valid the question of the validity of the law, which I personally really enjoy. I found that it crossed somewhat disciplinary lines between with both Kelsen and Weber very interesting, and particularly since that's an exercise. I don't see done too often, and it's a shame uh, in that theorists seem to be corralled, at least from what I encounter half of the time, into narrow academic lines a lot of times and not really engage with outside of those lines. And that's a shame because they have something valuable to say, right? Even if, like you pointed out, 
it seems on the surface that Weber and Kelsen have nothing to say about the rule of law, but they do clearly, right? I'll wrap it up here. And I think I'm, I'm most likely beneath time and apologies for that, but hopefully that can lead way to discussion a bit. Thank you very much, Carmen, for its detailed and one wide ranging comments. And I will suggest that Stephen reacts quickly to them, maybe in five minutes, and then we open the floor. And you want to pick um, the Carmen's comments, which are easier to deal with. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, let me just respond you know, very briefly into the how does it fit um, uh, question and also the the whole uh, peculiarities of the ang Anglo-American legal sphere, which were uh, the big po uh, problem for Jeremy Bentham. He wanted to rationalize the law. He, <laughs> he saw all of these uh, uh, precedents that created these legal devices that lawyers had to to master in order to be lawyers, uh, which didn't really make any sense. There were fictions and so on and so forth, uh, ought to be swept away and uh, so on. And that that business of fiction, I think, uh, actually does influence uh, uh, Kelson, who's uh, very who uses that term uh, quite a bit. And he, he, he sort of distinguishes between good fictions and bad fictions, but they're still both uh, uh, fictions. So how does it fit into um, these other discussions? Well, I think in general, what happens is that uh, people like, uh, for example, Catherine McKinnon, the feminist theorist of law, wants to take the notion of the rule of law and radically expand it to cover everything, every ideological issue she wants to cover. So, um, you know, if it's pornography, she wants to think, okay, we can squeeze out of the notion of the rule of law some kind of offense here that is against the concept of the rule of law and justify judges taking care of this rather than um, it being taken care of democratically. And that's one of the big tensions that actually we explore in this uh, uh, book, uh, Making Democratic Theory Democratic, <laughs> which is that uh, the, the theorists tend to eat up the territory that the public ought to be deciding about by defining democracy or defining uh, the rule of law in such a way that uh, it takes it out of the political sphere and makes it into a, a concept, part of the concept itself. Um, and that relates actually to the question of Kelsen and Weber's relation to um, the their successors in or especially the 20s which was a period in which um uh jurisprudential discussions in germany really blew up and carl schmidt is a big part of the story but also herman heller and they sort of fit into weber's picture of trying to sneak in substantive notions in the case of heller substantive notions of the rule of, of law into the notion of law and in the case of Schmidt, uh, the argument is basically that discretion is everywhere throughout the law and it can't really be controlled. So that what we really need to understand about the law is the nature of discretionary power, especially on the very top of the system where you ha the, the um, sovereign has the power to suspend the law. So discretion is more fundamental in a sense than the law itself. Now, later on, he uh, in the thirties, he writes, he, he sort of corrects course and, and talks about uh, um, the importance of bureaucracy. Um, and that's a part that doesn't, doesn't get into the uh, uh, American discussion of, uh, of Schmidt. Uh, it's this decisionistic element or this, uh, this discretionary element that is the part that gets um, actually discussed. Um, yeah, so I, I actually am fascinating and, and did an article in the Austrian Political Science Journal on the problems that Kelsen had with 
uh, getting a job in an American law school. And uh, Morgenthau briefly had one as well and then moved straight into uh, political science. But um, that legal background, um, except in the state of Louisiana, uh, uh, the continental legal background um, uh, doesn't fit because it's, they're all common law regimes and it involves all of these uh, precedents and um, uh, legal devices that people appeal to. So, um, yeah, it is a fascinating. The whole uh, there's actually a whole literature on what happened to German lawyers who uh, tried to make the transition into uh, American academia, and they end up in all kinds of places. So it's it's an interesting story. But it, but uh, as you point out, it's a uh, it's a big cognitive shift from one system to another. So I think I'll leave it at that. So. Okay. Um, thank you, Stephen. Uh, I would like to open the floor to whoever has questions. And we have some time, but I will still suggest uh, quick uh, questions and quick answers. Maybe not bundling uh, the questions and raising five at, at a time. Yeah, good. Wants to go first? Uh, you can send me a, a message, uh, or just in the chat, or raise your virtual hand. Matthias is first. Matthias, you, University of Saint Gallen. We can hear you, Matthias. Uh, sorry. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen, for uh, for this. Um... Very interesting presentation. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm. Uh, I would like to talk about one issue, which is, I mean, concerns my my own research. Uh, situations in which we have a written law, and the state is not enforcing the law. Uh, I mean, I have been uh, conducting research in in developing countries, but it's something that we can see not only um, in the periphery, but also in, in, in central yeah. developed countries. And and I'm interested in your opinion about this. To what extent this, this, this situation of the application of state power is attributable to the ineffectiveness of the state or to uh, the levels, certain levels of discretion that uh, have uh, state agents in in certain, because, I mean, depending on the answer, we have different, uh, the ineffectiveness of the state might be, uh, might, we might have the idea that there is a clear idea about the what is the law, and we have to enforce the law. But the idea of discretion is that might be different interpretation of the law and different logics. Right. And states on the I mean state agents on the street might say not. In that case, I'm not enforcing the law because of some reason. So I would like to know your your opinion on, on your take on that, especially in cases of this non enforcement. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, I think, a really interesting problem. And the that, I think, is the appeal of Schmidt, because he understands the uh, fact of discretion as absolutely central to understanding how states operate and fail to operate. Um, there's a, a famous article in uh, uh, American law, I think it's called The 12-Inch Fish, and it has to do with... Uh, um, uh, natural uh, um, resource enforcement of fishing rules. And what if you catch somebody and the rule is uh, that that uh, the fish can be no smaller than 12 inches and you find somebody with one with 11 inches, uh, do you arrest them and lock them up or do you just discretionally say, well, that's close enough uh, we're not going to to enforce the law. I think that's an interesting uh, uh, problem because you one way of thinking of it is sort of 
democratically that you know people have a sort of cultural understanding of what's close enough and they would regard uh, it is unnecessarily punitive to lock somebody up for having a fish that's you know an, a quarter inch smaller than the, the law um, and it would undermine the legitimacy of the the uh, enforcement uh, to do that but those cultural norms vary a lot and they're not legal norms they're they're something beyond the law that has to do with the exercise of uh, of discretion um, and another view of that would be the sort of Schmidtian view that, hey, they've got discretion, that, that that shows that the real power is in the user of discretion rather than in the law uh, itself. So I don't think there's, this is a soluble problem, I think, uh, in terms of legal theory. It is in the sense that uh, we can enact additional rules that might punish the the enforcer for failing to enforce it or something like that um uh but uh in the end you can't wring its discretion out of of the law and if you don't have enough enforcement devices to make pe the the enforcers be behave in accordance with the law then you're going to have a lot of uh ab you know abuse of uh, discretion but that abuse is kind of culturally defined rather than uh, legally defined. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, thank you, Matthias. Um, I, I would like to quickly abuse the chair to comment that um, Matthias is a scholar of illegal markets. And so he studies markets, including of stolen cars, which work successfully without having uh, the state in the background enforcing the orders. And I would like to underline that Weber can explain something which Gelsen will never explain, which is how these illegal non-state backed uh, markets actually work. And um, in the future, I would like to organize a session like this on uh, um, orders which are not backed by the state, but are actually valid in a sociological sense of the word. And, uh, using work uh, scholarship as Matthias. Um, who will be next with a question? Alfaro? Yeah. Sam here. Okay, go ahead, please. Yes, uh, I found Stephen's talk very, very useful, a, a project I'm working on, which is um, looking at Britain's unwritten constitution. And I've written on this in the context of Weber's concept of Caesarism, that you have a plebiscitary leader who basically uh, takes over the judiciary. Now, this happened in Britain with Boris Johnson, uh, that he didn't want to leave Parliament because he thought he had a mandate from the people which is against the representational system of the British Parliament. Now, my point is this, that's just a background point, is that everybody started shouting very loudly against this sort of dictatorial Johnson figure. And one thing they brought up consistently, or many times, was rule of law. And rule of law was never really defined in any way at all. So I looked it up. There's a man called Ferdinand Mount who's written about the British Constitution. And about 30 years ago, he was saying the British Constitution is based on the rule of law and the rule of law is obedient to the monarch. Yeah. So that's, one, <laughs> that's one of those traditional vestiges, you know, that, that's wrapped around. But it was seen, as Stephen said, in a mystical way. Um, and now it's, Mount has now written a book, which is actually called Caesarisms, Big Caesars and Little Caesars. And it goes through these effective would-be tyrants. Um, and he says the, the rule of law has now been taken over by the executive. Hmm. So that 
if you were looking for a sort of grund norm, which, of course, the British, they took common law to be the grund norm. And then they found out, actually, it can be overridden by an executive. And therefore, the rule of law is invoked, but it turns out to be friable. You know, it just falls to bits. So that's that's an observation, Stephen. Yeah. And I, I found your thoughts clarified a lot in what I was thinking about, because if you're going to argue for a written constitution in the United Kingdom, you would have to confront these points raised by Weber and Carlson. Yeah. No, I think this is a, a generic uh, problem of modern uh, administration that it's uh, always outruns the what can you what can be put into uh, statutes, and uh, uh, because of the complexity of the, these things, it really means that the executive decides what to enforce on itself. And the legislature is really sort of stuck in the dust behind uh, what these processes are. And if the executive, uh, as, as in the U.S., doesn't bother enforcing the law on the executive, other branches of the executive, it doesn't happen. Uh, there aren't any good ways of compelling the executive to actually do anything. Uh, and if you try, they just use more discretion to avoid the having to do it. Is, does anybody have a question? Well, there were some on the list. But, okay, um, then I um, raise my question or questions. Um, one uh, issue has already been raised by Carmel, uh, Stephen. Uh, um, were Weber and Kelsen the only scholars in, uh, let's say, the first half of the 20th century who were bothered by the ideological character of the term rule of law, Reichstag? And were the or are the other uh, thinkable solutions to the problem, apart from those uh, preferred um, by Weber and Kelsen. And uh, if I might break the rules that I set for this session, uh, I would like to add a, sec add a second question. And <clears throat> at some point in your presentation, you say, uh, you said, and you wrote, um, that according to Weber, um, validity fails the test of explanatory necessity, and that this is a basic Bavarian move. But and and I believe it, and I, I know you are an astute observer of Weber as an author. But if this is the case, why does Weber take take it for granted? Uh, why does he make such a basic move in his argument? in such an implicit way. Why is it so important for, for Weber not to put this thing, this move uh, in explicit words? Yeah, no, I think that the, um, yeah, he does it all the time. And um, um, even the definition, it is very tricky because for example, the definition of sociology is meaningful social action, blah, blah, blah looks very narrow, but the whole point of it is that uh, it it accounts for all of the things that these uh, metaphysical valuative theorists account for. So the background to this, I think, is always, you go back to Leo Strauss's uh, comment that uh, um, they're all liberating themselves from natural law. And that's cl clear if you look at um, a lot of the, the uh, forgotten writings uh, uh, during this period, they all had this kind of natural law component. And so that these are, are all part of a struggle with the, the legacy of natural law, which goes back to, uh, which involves really almost all of these 19th century um, liberal uh, theorists of the law like Ewing 
and uh, Yelenik, um, they're all trying to emancipate themselves in different ways, but they have different methods for doing it. So Yering does this in terms of uh, uh, the idea of freedom and uh, kind of utilitarianism as an alternative ground to natural law for understanding the evolution of the law, because natural law isn't going to help you with the evolution of the law. And uh, Yelenik uh, uh, is very... Uh, historical about uh, this, but he's got, um, uh, he invents an ideal typical normative conception of the law to, to uh, be opposed to this, these older um, uh, natural law infused conceptions. So I think that's the larger story and they're all part of this. And uh, by the, by the twenties, um, uh, they're still rooting out um uh, uh, natural law notions that uh, um, are st stuck in people's conception of the law. And then, of course, uh, there's the so-called natural law rebound after uh, 1945, where uh, uh, people, a lot of natural law Catholics in particular, who had been shoved to the sideline, all of a sudden become uh, authorities and uh, uh, relevant uh, at least for a few years. Um, that's my capsule history of, of the problem. Thank you. So um, you would say that Weber and Kelsen were an exception in the sense that most of his contemporaries were still trying to, uh, to get rid of um, natural law. Well, they were, they were extremely interested in doing exactly the same thing. So... They were sort of extreme versions of this, but the others tended to retain some, without calling it natural law, retains kind of a substantive conception of justice. And that's really what uh, uh, the issue is, whether it's a substantive uh, model of justice, and a, a, a socialist one in particular, that is uh, gives you a meaning of justice that's supposed to be ground for the law. They're both getting away from that. Mm -hmm. Seems I'm not seeing any raised hands. I'm going to, uh, to ask. Vote. Yeah. Just on Yelenik. I mean, Weber was pretty irritated with Yelenik, it seems, in some ways, in that Yelenik had a dual, what they call a dual theory of the state, that it had an input through the normative constructions of society in the way that Stevens just said. But the state was law in the Kelsonite sense. And so you've got a dual theory which isn't really satisfactory. Um, well, I've always found that with Yelenik. Um, in other words, it's, it's difficult to understand at, at this point in time. But but Weber's solution with, with Yelenik is says, stop going on about the state you've actually got to look to politics. You've got to democratise politics. You're not going to um, get to the sort of Reichstag that you want. Um, you've got to do it politically. In other words, the validity in the way we understand it in a substantive way lies with democratic politics. It doesn't necessarily lie with the jurist. No, that's really important. It, the the uh, uh, what they're wrestling with is this whole German tradition of state metaf metaphysics, which uh, you know has its English version and the metaphysical theory of the state uh, as well. And that's uh, um, was a big topic of discussion uh, during this period. And they're taking a very extreme uh, negative view of the. Uh, of state metaphysics that that really runs through both of them um excuse me my computer is slow right now um and, well i'm going to introduce a uh an idengeschichtliche question so and a question about the history of ideas is there someone here, maybe you, Stephen, but perhaps uh, Eddie, who can uh, tell us about the, I think, very brief 
intellectual virtual encounter between Weber and Kelsen when uh, Kelsen publishes in the archive. Um, so there seems to be a moment where they uh, get together in a scholarly life uh, around 1920, uh, uh, shortly before Weber passes away. And uh, can someone uh, give some context to this? There is also the famous um, 1980 paper by Norberto Bobbio comparing Weber and Kelsen, as Stephen yeah. has done in his right. own piece. Uh, maybe we should, uh, we could dedicate a few minutes to this. Yeah, I wish somebody could elucidate this historical mystery because I think uh, Kelsen actually uh, publishes in the archive as early as 1912. So Weber would have known about him. And that's also the time that Weber is writing uh, um, new methodological things on uh, um, uh, sociological, the reality of social, sociological concepts that tries to... Uh, um, de-metaphysicize them and and but both of them then you know keep developing their thoughts and um as far as i know there isn't any uh direct contact but i'm sure <laughs> somebody has more access to that than than uh, i do i've looked but i haven't found it so um but but uh, Weber is definitely on Kelsen's mind because he write when he writes in the in the early twenties. It's it's uh, he's he, uh, the whole sociological concept of the uh, law is uh, very much on his mind, and the the one that uh, is also on Weber's mind is uh, Eugen Ehrlich. Um, mm -hmm. This is uh, sort of weird in that um, he's been taken up by legal anthropologists as a kind of godfather. Um, but both of them thought he had hopelessly confused everything um, and uh, tried to derive a valuative uh, uh, conception of the law from a kind of social theory. Um, mm -hmm. Yes. So there's, you know, there's plenty to, to think about there, the research there. Uh, and uh, there are you know, sort of mutual references here and there, but it has to be reconstructed and uh, it was obviously cut off by Weber's death. So, mm -hmm. Eddie, did you find something? <laughs> yeah. Uh, as a last remark, it's also interesting that someone who is a bit young, who was a bit younger, but has a comparable relation to Weber, um, and I'm thinking of Eric Fergelin, is very explicit about what he thinks uh, uh, of Weber. But uh, there is not such a thing uh, coming from Kelsen. Uh, yeah, no, there is because Kelsen actually writes a book attacking Vogelin's view of Weber. Yeah. So he said, "No, you got everything wrong." And and so if you thought Kelsen was really different from Weber, no, here here he embraces Weber as the right guy, and Kel uh, Vogelin is the wrong the wrong one. And uh, Kelsen was in a way obsessed with. Uh, uh, Vogelin. Um, so he wrote a, a book late in life that he that was actually in the printing presses at the University of California, and he paid to stop the publication of it. And it was eventually published, but it's on religion and uh, um, political ideology. Um, it's uh, uh, it's a very uh, you really have to be into to the whole Vogelin uh, uh, set of issues to to untangle that one. Okay, let's uh, last chance to raise your hand and formulate a question. Otherwise, the next thing I will do is to announce the next session uh, uh, of this series. Uh, maybe um, if I don't get it, maybe Brenda can help me out, which is the next date on our calendar. Uh, Sorry, I was mute. Um, we'll be announcing our next uh, event on February. 
Uh, so stay tuned to our social media, uh, primarily Facebook and X now or Twitter hmm. before. Um, we we'll still have to confirm everything. So okay. So the details are forthcoming. Um, thank you, Stephen and Carmen, Carmen for thank your you. participation and uh to all the others for uh raising questions comments or just being there um and i apologize for running on too long sorry i missed, the, uh, missed the, the the exit route <laughs> no, uh, no problem Stephen. um that's all on our side and the uh, river scholars network with you a very good evening or afternoon depending on on your side of the pond. <laughs> yeah.